Good morning and I guess afternoon to some as well. Um, my name is Catherine Deline and I am the Senior Director of Clinical Services for Hospi Corps, the maker of the Macy catheter. On behalf of Hospi Corps, it's my pleasure to introduce you to today's webinar speaker, Lindsay Doak. Lindsay is the Director of Research and Education at Barry Dunn. She is a seasoned leader in the industry with 15 collective years of experience leading strategic direction and growth initiatives for healthcare education, business intelligence, and patient satisfaction markets. Lindsay's role with Barry Dunn includes spearheading the 2021 National Healthcare at Home Best Practices and Future Insights Study. Now, she has a passion for industry education, and she currently serves on several state and national association education committees. Her past experience includes the creation of education platforms and certification programs and providing strategic direction to align programs and content offerings within current industry needs. We are super lucky to have her with us today to discuss best practices in hospice and palliative care that were uncovered in Barry Dunn's comprehensive national study. Lindsay, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Catherine. And it's, it's very exciting to be here. I know it's a nice summer day in July. So I happen to know if you are here you really want to be here and so that's pretty exciting and so for those of you again that don't know me my name is Lindsay Doak and I am the director of research at Barry Dunn and we just concluded the biggest study in the history of healthcare at home and we're really excited to be sharing the results with the industry so that we can help organizations improve because from the start of this we know that healthcare at home home health hospice and home care is the future of healthcare, and we want to help organizations grow. Um, before I get started, I just want to go through a few processes to the study. Um, first of all, thanking our sponsors. We couldn't have done this without the national and state sponsors coming together to support this critical effort. And that included the National Association for Home Care, so NAC, as you know it, um, the NAC National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization, individual states, uh, leading Age, the Home Care Association of America, the NAC Forum of State Associations, the Council of State Home Care and Hospice Associations, and there's our data partner who gave us all of the claims data that goes behind the scenes for this. I strongly recommend um, them for data is Health Pivot. So again, we could not have done that without this group. And another group that was critical to this effort was our National Steering Committee. And here you can see we put together a fantastic steering committee to help put this study together. We put experts, there are clinical experts, financial experts, operational experts, um, vendors, experts in home health, experts in hospice, and experts in home care. Um, they all met to make sure that this study was a success. And again, we could not have done it without this group as well. So the study was a very comprehensive study and it did cover both home health and hospice. And today we will be focusing on the hospice aspect of it, but there were critical components to both. So as part of the study, we received 780 home health agency sites who participated in it. As we know, there's, there's about 9,000 home health is going down a bit, 9,000 total. So that's a great representative sample. And we had 249 hospice agency sites that participated in the study. And again, a good representative sample given the size and also the regions. We got a hospice to participate in all areas of every region of the country, every size and for-profit and not-for-profit status. I always like to start with this quote. There is a man by the name of Clayton Christensen. And if you have not read Clayton Christensen's books, I highly recommend it. I, I had the fantastic opportunity to see him present at the American Hospital Association a few, actually I say a few years ago, it was 10 years ago, 10 years ago. Um, and he was the author who invented something called disruptive innovation. And if you think about our industry, over the past three years, I have never seen more disruption than what has occurred to us. We have dealt with uh, massive, uh, massive disruption with COVID-19, massive staffing disruption, and then with both home health and hospice, you know, we're looking at value-based care. And what he says is almost always great new ideas don't emerge from within a single person or function, but at the intersection of functions or people that have never met before. And that is the study. We took 
data points from each of the organizations, in the end, there were actually 400,000 data points within the study. And we looked at all of these data points and we pulled out best practices. So there's no one organization doing all the things that, we're, that I'm gonna talk about today. That would be impossible. What we're trying to identify is a series of best practices so that organizations can implement one to two of them to help improve their practice. And so the goal of this session is to help inform you with insights. You know, some will be achievable in your, in, in your organization, some not so achievable. But if you can pick one to two to act on and help improve, um, that was the goal of the study. We wanna help organizations make little steps to change because we know that change happens when you make little steps. So we ask ourselves, what are the best practices the most successful agencies have implemented to respond to the industry changes? And that's what everybody wants to know. The first thing I wanna point out is that everybody knows there is a, a major staffing shortage right now. And when I looked at the data, we found that there's no magic key to recruitment. You know, if you look at the study, we had a whole staffing section in the study. If you look at the study and you look at where are people recruiting? So employee referrals, non-employee referrals, online uh, associations, universities, they're all doing the same thing. And the result is all the same. So there's no magic key there. When you look at benefits, again, um, the benefits don't vary significantly. I know in, in some cases a little bit, but we're not seeing a significant shift in benefits and recruitment efforts. So we have to say to ourselves, what can we do knowing this? You know, we know that there's no magic key to recruitment. So the answer isn't going to be go out and recruit more nurses or aides. Um, we can't do that. So everything I'm talking about today is what do we do with a staffing shortage, knowing that there is no key to recruitment. But one of the things I do want to point out is that there is room for advocacy. So 68% of agencies think that graduating nurses have no knowledge of home care. 54% of agencies think there is a misinformed or wrong perception of home care by nurses and by home care women, home care and hospice. And 75% of agencies feel that home health and hospice isn't well represented in college and nursing programs. So I know that there are national organizations, both NHPCO and NAC are, are putting significant efforts to increasing the advocacy but if you have an opportunity to be in a college university board to advocate for home health and hospice, um, we really need that to happen. Because what we need is we need the shift so that when clinicians, nurses graduate from nursing school, they choose home health and hospice. You know, we don't get the excitement of a TV show that draws us to them. There's too many TV shows on, hospice, on hospitals, in my opinion. But if we can start that advocacy and get more people to choose home health and hospice, we will see a difference in, the staff, in that staffing shortage. So then we take a look, knowing that, we also know that national value-based care is here. So in home health, it's value-based purchasing. So value-based purchasing right now, we're in our demonstration, our baseline year now, and then next year is the first performance issue. And in hospice, it's VFIT. So everyone is looking at the value-based care initiatives. What I've learned in my history is that everything you see with home health, you eventually see with hospice. And so by keeping your eyes open on what is going on with home health and what, what people are doing to navigate that, that will help us provide successful strategies for what is to come as we see a bigger value-based initiative in hospice. So with that, we get started on the results. Uh, what we did with the study is we took the top 15% for CAPS composite score. And by that, I mean, if you look at your CAPS family satisfaction scores, um, you'll see that there's individual measures in the family satisfaction scores. And we weighted those according to the star ratings. And I did check and I didn't see that the star ratings are out yet. Um, so there's a few that are weighted at half and the rest are weighted at a full point. And we came up with a CAPS composite score. And so of that CAPS composite score, we took the top 15%. So of all the organizations, the 249 organizations that participate in the study, we pulled out the top 15%. And then to make sure it's accurate, we compared those results with the national top 15%. So if they were dramatically off, we would know that our sample was not good. But what we found was that there was minimal difference between the top 15% of the people that participated in the study 
and the top 15% nationwide. So that tells us we did have a good representative sample. And then in addition to that, the hospice organizations had to show a positive revenue surplus. So you have to make money to keep the lights on so that you can provide care. So the organizations that are in these, these hospice centers of excellence had to show a positive revenue surplus. So you start at the beginning. Um, the first thing we talk about is which best describes your sales force used to generate referrals. And here you can see this was one of the things that was a pivotal moment for both home health and hospice. You know, you see they are primary clinical, they are non primarily non-clinical, they were equally clinical and non-clinical, and I have don't use these positions. Overwhelmingly, the centers of excellence, so again, looking back at those hospice organizations that had the top family satisfaction scores, use non-clinical staff for this role. And for hospice, this is an enormous shift because I know in the past um, with studies, we've seen this be normally clinical. And then, you know, I was asked on a presentation earlier, yes, but what does that do for the business? So the bottom line, and you can see at the bottom here, those who use non-clinical staff for this role also have the highest surplus ratio or profitability. So they're at 21% versus 11% for primary clinical and 16% for equally clinical and non-clinical. And then if you take a look, you know, who are you using for your coders? Again, non-clinical, billing, non-clinical, intake, highly non-clinical. And what we're learning from this is that while we face a critical nursing shortage, study data shows us that agencies are using non-clinicians for roles that aren't clinical in nature are doing so successfully without compromising quality. So if you have a role that is non-clinical in nature, while we are dealing with the staffing shortage and we don't have enough field clinicians, it is okay to fill that role with a non-clinician you will not sacrifice quality so that you can focus on deploying your clinicians to the field. You know, and that's a critical element of this study because as we are dealing with this critical staffing shortage, it's more important than ever to make sure your clinician fields, your field clinician roles are filled because there's a direct correlation between those being unfilled and lower quality and family satisfaction scores. So then we take a look at how does your agency define a referral? So you got the referral, it came in. So how do you define a referral? 83% of centers of excellence, any referral that comes to them, name only, anything, they do not need any qualifying content to identify that as a referral. So you got 8% that do minimally qualified and only 8% that do fully qualified. But the majority, 83%, and you correlate that with the median length of stay. And you can see there 31 days versus 23 and 23. And I will say for the median length of stay, we are looking at all agencies that participated in the survey, not just the centers of excellence. So for all agencies that participate in the survey, any referral that comes to them, a much higher median length of stay. And you take a look at that conversion rate. So you have any referral that comes in the door, 70 to 79% is the majority of centers of excellence have a referral rate of 70 to 79%. So what this is telling us is that you do not want to do, have any processes in place that make it so that referral does not come to you. And then once all those referrals come to you, then you can go and identify who is eligible for hospice. You know, a 70 to 79% turnover or, or conversion ratio is not great if you have highly qualified referrals that only are being accepted. But when you accept all referrals, that 70, 79% is that sweet spot. And again, you can look at that length of stay. So by fine tuning and really analyzing the hospice eligibility and making your conversion rate 70 to 79%, you're improving your family satisfaction and you are improving your median length of stay. Then we take a look at, you have the referral, it's in the door, um, what the majority of your admissions from referral and how long does it take them to be done? Overwhelmingly within four hours. You can see here family satisfaction scores and median length of stay are directly impacted by the amount of time it takes you 
from admission to getting that referral to getting that admission process started. So dramatically decreases for every four hours. I know a lot of organizations, it's a, it, that standard is within 24 hours, but you see a diminished family satisfaction rate the longer that takes, in addition to that length of stay, showing us that every hour counts. You know, when you have that end of life conversation with your physician or whomever you're having that end of life conversation you're having it with, every hour counts from the time you have that conversation until hospice is available to you. And so you're seeing that directly in the data that we're presenting. But then you, you look into this process and you take a look, well then, how are they making that four hours? Because I know a lot of organizations have come to me and said, I don't know. I mean, how would we do this in four hours or less? So then we take a look at who schedules your start of care visits. Overwhelmingly, organizations that are able to meet that four hour requirement use a dedicated scheduler to schedule that start of care visit. So if you correlate how long it takes from admission to referral to who is doing the start of care or scheduling the start of care visit, those who answered four hours overwhelmingly say they have a dedicated scheduler to schedule this. But what you can also see here, if you look at that CAPS composite score, um, when you have a clinical team scheduling your start of care, you are seeing a significantly de decrease in your family satisfaction scores. So then I had to go back to look at the data to say, why is this the case? Because I always have to ask myself, why is this the case? And then I did see a correlation between when a clinical team schedules that start of care visit, they're overwhelmingly taking 24 hours or longer, you know, most 24 hours, but longer from referral to admission. And so you want to speed up that process. The schedulers, you know, if you have a dedicated scheduling process, they know what's coming, they know what's in the pipeline, they can reserve space so that they know that they have that space for that admission and then schedule that within that four hours. So if you're taking a look at this, a dedicated scheduler is really critical to making that four hours and then also improving your family satisfaction scores. So then we take a look at caseloads. Um, and there, there's a lot of data in this presentation. So if anyone has any questions, again, feel free to type that in. So what is your average caseload per RN case manager? And you, historically, I've done this study several times, so this is not the first time we've done a study of similar size. Um, this number was 10. This was historically 10. Um, what we saw, and this was a dramatic shift, is that the centers of excellence, their caseloads are 13 to 18. So again, we take a look at why is that the case? So I take a look at the next slide. What is the average caseload per social worker full-time? Here, we're seeing a dramatic shift in the opposite direction. So historically, this has been more than 23. We're seeing that shift to 13 to 18. And you can see here with the green line, the bottom 20%, so those with the lowest family satisfaction scores, overwhelmingly more than 23 for their social worker cases. So when I looked at this data, what I saw were that organizations that have caseloads, so RN caseloads and social worker caseloads of 13 to 18, have a patient mix that is consistent with a healthy median length of stay. So their, their length of stays are not too short, and they're not too long. We're looking at median length of stays, as you can see here, of 32 days. And when you have a median length of stay of 32 days, what happens is you are able to integrate that social work. You have the capacity to do social work because you have the number of days and the RN, and you balance that out with the social work, and you're able to reduce the caseloads. And then the social work is also important improving family satisfaction. And I happen to know I had an experience with a family member and a, a social worker saved my dad's life. It, it, they really did. He was depressed, he was ready to die. And so for the first time, what we're seeing is an integration with the mental health and the physical health, and it, including the family's mental health. You know, this is happening in home health as well. We have social determinants of health going on in Oasis right now. 
for a holistic perspective and, and plan of care for the patients. And I think that's amazing. It's amazing to see this shift, you know, when you're able and when you have that healthy median length of stay, integrating that social work, we are seeing an increase in utilization of social work for the, that patient mix. So then you take all of these data points together, you know, you, you have an admission within four hours, you are, have a dedicated scheduler to schedule those start of cares. You have the right case manager, case ratios. When you're correlating that with the back end, so what do all these things mean when they're put together? Um, all of those organizations that are doing all of those things have a healthy length of stay. And by that, I mean, they are in that 30 median length of stay. We know the national average is about 19, but they're in that 30 median length of stay when we look at the best, the top performers for family satisfaction. And they have their billing department that verifies their insurance for prospective payments. So they're, they have that, that conversion ratio. Um, they have decreased end of period to day subscription and they have the highest surplus percentage. So we're seeing organizations that are implementing all of these best practices have the highest profit margins because they're incorporating all these practices for a well-oiled oiled organization. So then we take a look at pay practices. And this was an interesting slide here. So what is the primary pay practice for registered nurses? Here you can see hourly, salary plus visit rate for after hours and weekends, and salary only. Overwhelmingly, organizations with the highest family satisfaction score and healthy median length of stay are salary only. And so, you know, you ask yourself the question. So I had to then pull out the bottom 20% for this one. And what we see is that there is a significant decline in family satisfaction for when you have a salary plus visit for after hours and weekends. So of course I had to talk with this and I had to talk about this with Catherine actually about why this was the trend. And what we're seeing here is that when you are, working 40 plus hours, so if your salary plus after hours and weekends, the clinician burnout is significant. And so you're seeing an impact on clinicians working more than 40 hours and the family satisfaction scores. And what this would tell us was would that it would be more beneficial to have dedicated resources for weekends, nights, and I know some organizations, I, I have another slide about this, use travelers for those positions if you're unable to fill that. By reducing the amount of work that clinicians work to 40 hours, so for the salary, you're gonna have a dramatic increase in family satisfaction. So the, the hours, the, the rates for the hours after hours and weekends is having a significant decrease on family satisfaction scores. And then we look at this one. So what is the average unweighted productivity per eight hour working day for nurse case managers? And, and you know, the industry standard has always been four to four and a half. Um, we see the low performers at three and a half to four. And so it's interesting because you would think that low performers, you know, if you had less visits per day, that you would have an increase in family satisfaction scores. But what we're actually seeing is that that four to four and a half visits per day is the sweet spot. And so what this is actually telling us is that it's not necessarily a low productivity or more time in the home that's gonna lead to those higher family satisfaction scores. It's the overall operations of the organization. So if you're, if you're maintaining a healthy productivity level of four to four and a half visits, they're good possibility that your overall organization is being run very well. And so that is then impacting your family satisfaction scores. So if you have a question in mind about what that key productivity level is for your organization, it's four to four and a half visits is what the overwhelmingly centers of excellence do. And then this one was interesting. So we asked about complementary therapies for hospice organizations. So what complementary therapies do you offer? And we pulled out the ones that we saw were being used and had an impact on scores. I think there were 10 different complementary therapies that we asked about ranging from Reiki to music therapy. Um, the two complementary therapies 
that were used by the most successful organizations were massage therapy and music therapy. So as you can see here, 88% of hospice centers of excellence offer massage therapy and 79% of hospice centers of excellence offer music therapy. So I, I think this is a pretty interesting statistic, you know, where I think, I know we're always getting questions about what type of complementary therapies people are offering. And so it's interesting to see that that massage and music are really highly used by successful organizations. And then for this question, we actually asked organizations if they were home health and hospice. And for the purposes of the study, we did have a lot of participants who offered home health and hospice. It was about 60% of participants had both. So 40% um, were either just hospice or home health, and then 60% offered both home health and hospice. And we asked them, if you have both home health and hospice, is there a centralized intake process or is it separate? And you can see here, overwhelmingly, they use a separate intake process um, for centers of excellence. Um, and then the more interesting statistic here is that by having that separate process, you're increasing that length of stay by a significant amount. You're looking at eight days in terms of the median length of stay. So, you know, I know somebody had asked me, is this, a, does this question mean it's, it's two intake departments or one intake department with two separate areas and we didn't really clarify that in the question it could be either but having a, a, a dedicated person for hospice when those referrals come in so that they're able to identify the hospice patients and not having somebody who is managing home health and hospice and then identifying where the patient falls seems to be the best practice for hospice organizations. And then we take a look at this. So 60% of hospice centers of excellence offer 30 to 50% of their patients' bereavement services prior to death. And I know that this number probably could be higher, you know, depending on how you define bereavement services. But what's interesting is that when you are managing a hospice caps product, which I have done in my past, one of the number one things that families say, well, there's two things that families say that you see repeated on a lot of the surveys. And the first is that they wish that they had received the hospice benefit earlier. And then the second is they wish they received bereavement services earlier. So by offering those bereavement services, even prior to death, you're increasing your family satisfaction rates. And then 100% of hospice centers of excellence offer bereavement satisfaction surveys. So. Um, you know, I know that this is something that is not required like CAPS is, but you can see that it has a significant impact because if you are offering those bereavement satisfaction services or surveys, you can identify if your services are working or not and then make improvements. And then we get into, so we're looking at palliative care. So 88% of hospice centers of excellence offer a palliative care program. And this is compared to 63% of centers of excellence or home health centers of excellence who offer palliative care program. And there's a few slides in here where I, I do add the home health component because I think it's interesting to look at who is out there offering palliative care. Now, um, the definition of palliative care, of course, differs site by site, but it, you know, this is a significant increase in the amount of organizations we're seeing offering dedicated palliative care programs or what they're calling a palliative care program. But that 88%, I mean, that's a significant amount of hospice centers of excellence who are now incorporating palliative care into their care continuum, which, which is, of course, fantastic. So when you take a look at the results of that, um, those hospices that offer a palliative care program see a higher length of stay than those that do not for the, for the survey respondents. So we're seeing an average length of stay for hospices with palliative care of 72 days versus 26 or 57 days for hospices without. And then you're seeing a median length of stay of 26 days versus 19, which is the national average for those without. And I know this is a question because um, there are a lot of organizations out there that are actually seeing a decrease in their hospice length of stay because of the palliative care program. So when you look into it, you're, you're really looking at what you're providing as part of your palliative care program. So if you're offering a full suite of services, we do we have a question on there, do you, what do you offer as part of your palliative care program? If you're offering everything that they could be offered in hospice, 
you are seeing a decrease in length of stay. But if you are offering services to help them as they transition to hospice, but not the full suite of services, you, you see an increased length of stay because at that point, the patient has a reason for transferring to hospice. And the other thing we're seeing is we're seeing frequent screenings of palliative care patients for hospice. So within our best practice organizations, our study organizations, we are seeing that they regularly screen both their home health patients for hospice and then their palliative care for hospice as well. So that's why for the study participants, you're seeing that increase in length of stay for those organizations. And then for home health, you know, because this is palliative care and palliative care reaches all areas of healthcare, we see a significant decline in rehospitalization for palliative care. So if you're a home health and a hospice organization and you have that palliative care, ensuring that you offer that continuum of care is critical. You know, if you're, you know your patient, they're under your care as they're navigating, they're not, they don't quite qualify for home health yet, or they don't qualify for home health, they don't quite call, qualify for hospice yet, but they remain in your care so that you, they know who they can go to if they're having problems, you know their symptoms, you know how to treat them. Um, we're seeing a, a significant decrease in rehospitalization scores. So it's interesting because rehospitalization is a significant initiative in home care. And um, at the same time, there's not much in terms of, of finance to reimburse for palliative care. So, you know, we're balancing that all out. But in order to reduce hospitalizations, we are seeing that palliative care is a critical piece of that, you know, maintaining that continuum of care. And this is, you know, we ask what it butch best describes your palliative care program, and this is for hospices. And you, this was a question where you could check all but apply. And what you see here is that you have the medical consultation model, interdisciplinary model, care and transition. Um, you know, this is not 30, 30, 30, 30%. If you look at the legend over there, um, they're all about 80%. So it's, it's organizations saying, yes, we offer all of those. And again, it goes to the fact that, you know, we really don't have a solid definition of what palliative care is. You know, somebody had asked me, is it an approach to care or is it a specific type of care like hospice? And the answer is yes. <laughs> it's, 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 we don't know. We, you know, there's a lot of people doing some great things out there with palliative care. And I know there's organizations. I know we had a steering committee member that took a lot of time and, and dedicated her work to trying to define what palliative care is. But really, right now, currently, there is no true definition of palliative care. So we're seeing organizations who are implementing a lot of different things as part of their palliative care organizations. And then in terms of staffing for palliative care, overwhelmingly, we are seeing hospices who are dedicating a separate team within the hospice program for their palliative care. So very few, none of the centers of excellence, but very few of the total participants use hospice staff, and then a few combined with separate team and hospice staff, but overwhelmingly, they're dedicating a specific team within their hospice program to, to issue that palliative care. And then you can see here, you know, when we go back to that correlation between palliative care and hospice, what I think is phenomenal about this is that clearly, because that length of stay is higher, than the other two, there is great communication between that team and the hospice program. So when these, when these transition to hospice, you're seeing a higher length of stay. So again, a tribute to a well-run oper operations for that hospice group that has that palliative care program to ensure that those palliative care patients transition to hospice in a timely manner. And then 98% of home health and hospice centers of excellence have a formalized screening process to identify palliative care patients. And I know there's a lot of those out there. Um, NHPCO has 10 or so really good screening tools and you could take that and take a look at which one best you need to find the one that best uh, matches your specific palliative care program. So if you go to NHPCO's website, they have a really good set of screening tools on there and they've done a lot of research in that. But if you are in palliative care or looking at palliative care, um, we are seeing a significant amount of organizations that have a form formalized screening process, which is resulting in success of their palliative care program. So then we take a look at technology and telehealth, which is a critical component of the study. And I, I'd like to start with this one because we asked organizations, how do you manage 
the staffing shortages. You know, again, going back to that first slide, we are in the middle of an, a major staffing crisis right now. Um, and how do you manage that? So if you take a look here, again, it goes back to that uh, kind of similar messaging to that recruitment strategy. Everybody's trying everything. You know, we're, we're doing travelers, we're doing adoption more technology, some organizations are turning away referrals, some are increasing caseloads. But with the bottom performers, you're seeing more of the first two. And with the top performers, you're seeing more of the second two. And so, you know, when you have the adoption of technology, and again, this is based off of family satisfaction scores. And the same thing applies to home health and patient satisfaction scores. And one thing I'd like to point out is, you know, technology is the future of healthcare. We, we will not be able to meet the needs of the aging population without integrating technologies into the delivery of care. So whether that's telehealth or artificial intelligence or other programs, um, but you have to make sure that the delivery of care is integrated with the technologies. The thing that is decreasing family and patient satisfaction is when the two are, are operating individually and there's no communication, and then that is resulting in frustration by the families and patients. And so I don't think that there's anything here that says you know, don't use technologies to, to meet your staffing shortages, but what we are saying is making sure you're smart about implementing the technologies that you're implementing. And then, you know, turning away referrals, obviously not something we want to see happening in hospice. It's going to impact your family satisfaction rates, as you can see here. Um, but, but again, you know, we want to make sure that we have all the staff and we're doing all the things we can so that we can avoid that moving forward. And then do you currently electronically share your data with other providers? And the interesting insight about this is that it, people who say they do it, they do it with everybody. So either you're doing it or you're not. Um, you know, obviously family satisfaction, it doesn't impact so much, but what it does impact is that length of stay. And so you're seeing organizations that aren't sharing this information um, have a 10 day decline from the median length of stay of organizations that are doing this. And so again, you know, making sure that they're communicating that continuity of care, that everybody is on board and understanding to best treat the patients that are under our care. And then how long on average does it take uh, your organization or your clinicians to complete a start of care using your point of, care, your, point of care, your point of care system, including visit time for documentation? And so for this one, you can see here, interesting, overwhelmingly, the centers of excellence, two and a half hours to three hours. You know, and then you take a look at the bottom 20%, less than two hours. So just as important to spend that time as it is to then look at your productivity measures. So um, you don't want to be too focused on productivity and not spend the time that two and a half hours to three hours for a start of care seems to be the critical time period for that. So you're seeing the highest family satisfaction rates when you have two and a half to three hours. Well, less than two hours obviously is probably too quick to fully have those conversations, to document everything, and then you're seeing a decline in family satisfaction. So the two and a half hours is the sweet spot. Now you will see that we do have centers of excellence who say three hours or more. So there's a little bit of those organizations that are spending three hours or more with their satisfaction rates. But when you correlate this with your profitability ratios, so this is where all of the metrics come together, what you're seeing is that again, two and a half hours to three hours is that sweet spot. You know, less than two hours, you have very bad family satisfaction scores. You know, two to two and a half, you, we didn't really have anyone on there. Two and a half to three hours, really a good metric for family satisfaction. Minimal adjustment in your, in your profitability ratio. So you have to balance out your family satisfaction scores and it's really probably not worth it for that 0.03%. But then once you get to three hours or more, you drop to 14%. And so, um, you know, we see that the, a little bit of the family satisfaction scores were there, but you're going to see a significant decline in your profitability if you're spending more than three hours completing that start of care. 
And so now we get into the importance of engagement. So with this one, I like to start with this video because this is really the test for everything we're about to talk about. And the reason I like this video is because it's rare for industries to have a remote workforce. You know, there's not many industries out there that have a remote workforce. We are one, we have a remote workforce and the delivery industry also has a remote workforce. And if you take a look, the first package dropped off, dropped in the rain. The second package obviously picked everything up. And so the first employee clearly seemed disengaged. Um, and then what's going to happen if you have employees that are disengaged? Well, all of those things we just talked about are not going to matter if your employees are disengaged. So, you know, this, this delivery package system, I know FedEx, all of them, um, UPS, they all have their very well-run organizations. They know exactly how many drivers they need to deliver the packages. They know exactly how many packages they need to deliver in a day, productivity, they know how many packages they need to deliver and the timeliness of the delivery. Um, but then when you have a disengaged employee who's dropping it off in the rain, you're gonna have a decrease in customer satisfaction. So for us, that's the family satisfaction and a decrease in quality. So we take a look at um, employee engagement. So 91% of hospice centers of excellence measure their employee engagement at least annually. So if you're a hospice organization, it is critical that you're measuring your employee engagement. You know, 18 months was also a sweet spot for a lot of organizations, so at least every 18 months. Um, when you take a look at what percentages of your hospices are engaged, so you have overwhelmingly with the centers of excellence, 90% or more of their employees are very engaged. So you're seeing a breakdown in the bottom 20% where that kind of goes all over the place, but look at that engagement level for those centers of excellence. And so again, really directly tied to family satisfaction scores and outcomes if your employees are engaged. And then we take a look at what is your organization's turnover rate? With centers of excellence, who remember their employees are, are really engaged, at 16 to 20%. So that's that's somewhat of an industry standard. Um, you wanna see, you know, I know that there's a lot of organizations that wanna see under 10%, you know, that's a very difficult metric to achieve. And also, as I've been pointing out to other organizations, there is such a thing as non-regardable turnover. So you have to be careful what you wish for, you know, under 10%, if you have a low performer, you might want that turnover to happen. So that's 16 to 20%, you might wanna get down to 11 to 15%, but that seems to be the sweet spot for family engagement. For those in the bottom, so those organizations with the lowest family satisfaction scores, we see over 30% is their turnover rate. And we know with families, and it's with the same with patients in home care, you know, if they are used to a person, an aide, a volunteer, a, a clinician coming to their home, and then the next time around, it's a different person and they've created a relationship with that one person, that is directly going to impact your family satisfaction rates, which again, your star ratings as they come out. So over 30%, and then imagine what that's doing to your bottom line. You know, they say that you take the clinician's salary and you multiply it by two and a half, and that is the cost of replacing that person. So if you're, if you're over 30%, that's gonna have a significant impact on your bottom line. But another thing is that, um, what I noticed is that, you know, we asked this question in the past 12 months, is that the majority of home health and hospices had a, a turnover rate of 16 to 20%. However, home health, more home health agencies than hospice agencies had turnover rates of less than 10%, but 
while more hospice agencies had turnover rates of 30% or higher. So when you looked at everybody, not the bottom performers or the top performers, we did notice that hospices had a higher turnover rate in the past 12 months. And so I think that's an interesting metric and I will look further into that. But um, you know, we can see that that 16 to 20% is really the key metric for all organizations, but we're seeing a higher turnover rate for hospices than home health on a whole for all organizations that participate in the survey. So that is an interesting metric that hospices should pay attention to and keep in mind. And then as we're looking at this, you know, the turnover rate, I'm seeing that there's a direct correlation between when their new nurses are expected to be at full productivity. So 73% of hospice centers of excellence have six weeks to full productivity. So for those organizations who had less, you know, less amount of time to get to full productivity, some actually had a week. So that, that seems, I mean, maybe if it's a veteran clinician, they're hiring all veteran clinicians that know what they're doing, but a week seems like a very quick time period to get to full productivity. But organizations that are taking at least six weeks to get to full productivity, meaning they're fully training their staff, they're giving them time to get to learn their EMR, they're putting them through the processes, um, they have lower turnover rates and higher family satisfaction scores. And so a critical metric as we're looking at turnover rates in hospice, you know, making sure your clinicians have the time to get caught up to speed and they don't feel like they're just being thrown into the field seems to be a critical metric for reducing turnover rates. And then we see the perceived reason for turnover. So we asked home health and hospice organizations, what is your perceived reason for turnover? So why do you think your clinicians are leaving? Um, COVID-19 related burnout was the number one response. So you can see there, you know, with hospice here at like 60% that said that, um, other job opportunity pay related, that's at 30%, really none, you know, home care related burnout. So driving at the drive time a little bit. Look at leadership. Um, there's not even a sliver here. I was like looking to see if there's a sliver there. There's not even a sliver here. So nobody said leadership, you know. And I, I think about it and you think about who filled out the survey, it was leadership. And so obviously um, they probably skewed the results a little bit, but you have to keep in mind that there have been study after study after study that show that the number one reason an employee leaves their job is because of their direct relationship with their supervisor. So as much as you know, COVID really foreshadowed or you know, everybody was thinking about COVID and COVID burnout, you have to think about how did leadership manage the COVID-19 related burnout? How are they managing this? You know, I know Richard Branson, who many of you know, he's one of the wealthy people, um, had a quote that said, you wanna train your staff so that they perform, they could perform the, the best at any company, but you want to treat them so that they don't wanna leave and, and work at those other companies. And, you know, it, it's a testament to what we're talking about here in the study. You know, you wanna offer training for the productivity, know the metrics, but you also have to make sure that you have a culture, a nice culture in your organization so that everybody, you're reducing turnover, everybody's happy, you're at full, full. and that starts with leadership. It's leadership that you trust, leadership that values all of these things we're talking about today. And then that trickles down to the employees and burnout and turnover. And then we ask, what is the impact of leadership? What do you think the impact of leadership is gonna be in the next three to five years? Um, for home health organizations, they feel the impact of leader, the turnover will be negative. And 64% of hospice agencies feel the impact of leadership turnover in the next three to five years will be neutral. So I don't know, I just thought this was an interesting metric. You know, home health organizations obviously are not looking for the turnover, whereas hospices feel that it won't really have an impact on the industry. And then, you know, I guess probably because hospices don't think that they will have an impact on the industry. We see that 89% of home health agencies have a formal strategic legacy plan in place for leadership. And 11% of hospice agencies have a formal strategic plan, legacy plan in place for leadership. So I do say that I have seen organizations with leadership turnover that do not have a formal strategic legacy plan in place. And that usually does not result in anything positive. And so I don't know if it was our sample size or, or that neutral perspective of turnover, 
but it is highly recommended that organizations put this in place because you want to make that transition seamless for your, for your employees. You don't want to have a gap in leadership um, that's going to have a significant impact on morale and processes and operations. And I've seen organizations that have done that. And again, nothing good can happen from not having this in place. And then for turnover, we see that 51, they do it every eight, eight plus years. And 65% of hospice agencies turn over senior their leadership every eight plus years. So you're looking at an eight plus year turnover. And I will tell you, when you're at less than eight plus years, what we see is a significant decline in patient and family satisfaction. So there is a direct correlation between a leader and their length in the organization. And that eight plus years seems to be the sweet spot. Um, if an organization is turning over leaders more frequently than that, or very frequently, in fact, you know, if they're turning them over every year or two, obviously that's an indicator that there's something going wrong with the culture and the operations, but that has a, that is the number one component that had a direct impact on patient and family satisfaction. So, you know, the fact that the best practice organizations are seeing this turnover eight, every eight plus years is not surprising because that does directly correlate with those family satisfaction scores. And so that concludes our presentation for today. Um, for those of you that have not yet downloaded the report, we do have a report that summarizes all of this information. You know, as I said, we had 400,000 data points in the presentation in, in their study. Um, the report includes about 10% and this presentation was about 5%. So you can get more information in that report um, by going to the website and downloading that report. And it is complimentary for anyone that wants to participate in that. All right, Catherine, I'll turn it back over wow. to you. Thank you, Lindsay. Some truly, truly powerful insights. I mean, any hospice or palliative care organization can take one or more of these, just as you suggested, suggested, and really run with it to excel in their own market, right? I mean, um, just, just, and for others, right, it's very validating. Um, hoping you are one of those centers for excellence, right? And you can say, okay, I'm doing something right here. So um, very, very impactful. We do have time for one quick question. Um, and, and the question is, I am wondering if the case manager taking 13 to 18 patients in their caseload are also taking after hour call or weekend call. Was that something that was looked at in the study? Oh, well, I mean, my in looking at the fact that the majority of the best practice organizations that had that 13 to 18 pay their staff salary, um, that would tell me that that is not like the salary is a 40 hour and they're having other dedicated resources for the after hour and the salary. So, um, you know, again, it is a full picture, but that would tell me, no, they're not taking after hour call and we can call based on their salary structure. Makes sense. I and mean, that just contributes to the burnout and whether they're getting paid extra for those hours after hours they're having to perform them regardless. So yeah. the bottom line would be, you know, um, it, it will be beneficial from a quality and financial um, standpoint to have a separate um, yeah. salary position for those weekend after hours on call. Exactly. And of course, census matters in that, correct? Mm -hmm. You know, um, the smaller hospices may be jumping and saying, see, <laughs> but you're not, might not quite be there from a financial standpoint, but Yes, and there are a lot of factors that go into all of this data, you know, the acuity of your patients, obviously, you're not going to be able to maintain those case manager ratios. And so this is like a generalized survey, but obviously organizations have to do what's best for their patient mix and their structure. Yes, geography also comes in. Geography, for sure. sure. Thanks, Lindsay. So appreciate your time and insights. And thank you for all of your participants. Hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you.